Good afternoon. Thanks everybody for joining us. My name is Alyssa Doroff. I'm the cyber technical leader here at NFP based in New York City. I'm very pleased to have Sarah Hutchins, who is an attorney with the law firm of Parker Poe, here with me today. Sarah is going to talk to us about some general contractual provisions and specifically how to best position your company when negotiating language around safeguarding of personal information. She's also going to talk to, about, talk to us about some relevant regulations, updates, and how best to stay compliant. Now, a bit about Sarah's background. Sarah helps clients navigate business litigation, government investigations, and data privacy concerns. Her experience with business litigation and government investigations strengthens her cybersecurity and data privacy practice. Sarah is well credentialed in cybersecurity as a certified information privacy professional in the United States and a board certified specialist in privacy and information security law with the North Carolina State Bar. Her experience includes providing counsel to national companies on compliance with federal and state privacy regulations and coordinating responses to data breaches. A little more about Parker Poe. The Parker Poe Law Firm has represented organizations in transactions, regulatory issues, and complex litigation in the Southeast and around the globe. Parker Poe has more than 230 attorneys serving clients from eight offices in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Washington, D.C. Before we get started and I turn it over to Sarah, just a quick note on logistics. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll answer them at the end. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to get started. Sarah, over to you. Thank you. Um, both um, NFP and Parker Poe, you'll see a disclaimer on your screen that this does not constitute legal advice. I'm here to um, give you my general thoughts on the state of the world with respect to data privacy and security and how I can help you with your obligations. Um, but uh, thank you, Alyssa, for that background. Um, my contact information is on the screen now. If um, you have any follow-up questions that I'm not able to address today. So um, an overview of the presentation, I'm going to talk about some of the legal implications that are at issue that you should consider um, at all times, but especially when you're presenting your company for insurance coverage in the cyberspace. There are other non-legal things to do, um, obviously having your tech house in order. Um, one of the things that I always recommend that's really outside of the legal scope to start, but helps me as an attorney understand the potential um, regulations and other risks that are involved from a legal perspective, is to really understand the data you have and to conduct a data mapping exercise that will show you what you have, will help figure out what regulations might apply, but also can help you assess potential vulnerabilities um, that would be um, that should be corrected before going to um, to insurance and just to ensure the safety of your organization. Um, so my focus today is going to be on the legal side, but it's not um, to uh, disregard the importance of technical technical controls that um, should be in place at your organization. Um, so. Focusing on the legal, I'm going to talk about statutory requirements um, that may affect your company. A lot of them are at the federal level, and that will um, usually depend on the type of industry you're in. We don't yet have an overarching federal law, but also state laws. Um, and I'll be focusing today not on every requirement that may exist. Uh, every state at this point has a data breach response. Uh, statue and many have um, data um, maintenance related statutes, but I'll be focusing instead on the types of agreements that you should have in place or you may be required to have in place that insurance companies are increasingly asking to see record of. I'll talk about some general contractual principles that um, whether you're required by statute or um, as a best practice you should have in place for your interactions with your vendors or others to which you share um, personal data of consumers and employees or others. I'll talk about privacy policies. Again, increasingly I'm seeing insurance companies seek um, evidence of those or investigate that on their own when they're vetting companies, uh, as well as incident response plans. That's um, always of heightened concern um, to make sure that a company is ready to respond to any kind of security incident. Um, again, presenting best face, I will talk about uh, different uh, documents that companies should have in place 
guarding the protection of data and showing regular and appropriate data maintenance procedures with respect to employees, which is um, the most common kind of interface with the data that you may have and collect um, and where guidance can be shown and attention to the importance of it can be demonstrated to your insurer. Um, and finally, I'll talk about um, some practices that may help in the merger and acquisition process, whether you have insurance that's specifically focused on that or in general, um, as you go through some of the documents to be seeking in that process that um, can assure you that the company that you may be merging with or acquiring is uh, has their data house in order. So starting with um, some of the statutory requirements, uh, this is just an overview of what we'll cover. Um, not all of it in detail, but I'll try to focus on some of the contractual um, obligations that exist. Um, it's one thing though, that I should point out from the start to comply with um, these statutory requirements. It's the second thing to document your compliance. So I urge um, everybody on the call to make sure that your enterprise has a document management strategy um, to track your compliance with these various statutes and the agreements that you should have in place um, to make sure that you're having fully executed agreements, for example, when interacting with your service providers, and also that they're being stored in an appropriate way, um, that they are being that they are protected, and that the principle of least privilege is applied to your um, your documents and your confidential information and personal data. And that concept of least privilege means that an employee only has access to what they need to have access to. That um, information is not just uh, broadly available to all on the system. And, and that can include some of the agreements that we're gonna talk about today, but also just in general, the confidential information that a company might have. Um, finally, last but not least, um, it's not really a statutory requirement, but so much of the law in general in the United States, as compared to other jurisdictions, is really developed through civil litigation. I'm seeing increasing um, guidance from court decisions on what reasonable security measures mean under the law. Um, for example, uh, training of employees against phishing and ransomware attacks. That's increasingly um, becoming a topic of uh, the civil litigation field as to what companies should do as far as the bare minimum to avoid negligence types of claims or to give more context to a contractual requirement that um, a company employ reasonable security measures. So paying attention to the direction of the case law is really important too. Um, under HIPAA, um, there may or may not be a, um, businesses on this call that, to which this would comply. Um, a lot of people think just all health information in general is going to be subject to HIPAA, and that's not true. It it's only affects covered entities and those that um, entities that serve covered entities. So a regular non-health related business may not have, um, may not come under HIPAA, except to the extent that they offer a self-insured um, uh, insurance plan and the documents that are associated with that plan would potentially be covered under HIPAA. If you are um, an organization that is covered under HIPAA, either because you're a covered entity or because you're a business associate, um, like an IT company that serves a covered entity, then you need to be very careful to document um, your relationship through a business associate agreement. This is required under HIPAA and the Office of uh, Civil Rights enforces this requirement. They actually make it somewhat easy um, from a starting point in that they have a standard business associate agreement that companies can use and modify. Um, but, but I encourage those that are covered under HIPAA to um, not just take that standard document without considering some of the other contractual clauses that we'll talk about later that might be important like an indemnity clause or an attorney's fees clause in the event of a security incident. But this is an important um, document to maintain. I'm actually in a litigation right now where we've got about 600 customers that um, some of which have business associate agreements and a lot of my time is um, spent tracking those down. So um, maintain your, your house in good order 
and keep track of agreements that are required under statute like this one. If you're a financial institution, again, the, the federal government's sort of focused on various industries. There's no overarching um, law. Then you may have um, obligations from a federal perspective under various statutes, including the Fair Credit Reporting Act and FACTA, um, which modifies the Fair Credit Reporting Act. The, those um, instances are going are going to require companies that essentially run and assess credit worthiness or report on credit worthiness to Equifax and Experian uh, to have written policies and procedures regarding the way that information is kept and, um, and also document certain uh, notices that are provided like a notice of an adverse decision. Employers that are running credit checks need to likewise keep track of those um, the, their compliance with the statute and have a, a robust document management um, procedure to keep these in line in case they're asked for by regulators or by insurance. Um, the Graham Leach Wiley Act it affects financial institutions and has a lot of similar requirements, such as having written response plans, um, but also then um, written contracts with those that. Um, a financial institution shares information with, maybe for marketing purposes or otherwise. I bring up that um, one in a, um, by emphasizing financial institution in that a lot of entities don't realize they're a financial institution. They're thinking about it just in the context of a bank, but financial institution can mean really any entity that extends credit. So auto dealerships um, and, and things like that. So analysis under that of whether that um, uh, could potentially apply to your business, whether you give financial advice in any way, and assessment of if you have a written contract with all of your vendors um, with whom you share uh, personal data, and, do, and whether or not you have a written um, a due diligence and response plan will be important. Um, one other not quite financial institution, but um, area of federal focus is, of course, on public uh, companies through the SEC. The SEC has a very robust uh, roadmap for compliance um, and data protection maintenance for public companies that they must abide and document. And uh, I expect when uh, the federal government continues to extend these obligations on non-public companies, they will use uh, entities like the SEC as guidance. But the more that regulations um, specify the need for written policies and written agreements with vendors, the more insurance companies will seek to, um, to confirm that compliance um, with those that they're going to insure or ask that those representations be made um, that a company is indeed in compliance with the various regulations that guide them. The FTC Act um, applies to really everyone, every business, um, and that, um, in, in important part for this conversation, focuses on a business's obligation to conduct itself fairly and um, not engage in unfair and deceptive trade practices. So where this comes up in the data space, at least at this point, is um, really when dealing with consumers is in the area of the privacy policies and other in, uh, public engagement with a consumer where a company makes statements about how they are going to be um, controlling and maintaining and using uh, personal data that's collected. So. The FTC has gone after many companies, I'll talk about one recent example in a second, for um, making statements about the treatment of data, but then ultimately not engaging in the controls that they promised that they would uh, through their privacy notice to the public. Um, one of the most recent and salient examples would be Zoom, um, which we are on right now, where there was a consent order in um, at the end of last year dealing with um, accusations that the FTC made that Zoom was not um, engaging in end-to-end -end encryption, um, that they were unclear or deceptive on the level of encryption that they were providing to constituents using the product, 
and deceptive on the level of security storage. And, and all of that, um, for the most part, is coming from their public facing documents that describe their policies. So the consent order is required Zoom to implement increased security features, collection practices that um, have more um, clarity, the protection of certain covered information, and importantly, a documented information security program and having to document compliance. And when entities have that um, or potentially could be subject to that, um, it's important to show the um, to to everyone just for regulator uh, exposure, um, civil exposure, but also in securing appropriate insurance uh, to to show that you, you say you mean what you say that if you promise that you're going to treat data a certain way through contracts or to consumers that that you actually do that. Um, when we think that we will have some federal legislation, and we'll talk about that now. Um, it's most likely that the FTC would be the agency that um, enforces a, a more global federal regulation. They have um, really been jockeying for that role uh, and made it pretty public in um, statements that they see themselves as fit to enforce data privacy and security at a federal level, and, and they're the most likely agency to do so. Um, so we'll talk about states, and in the, in the, it's called the patchwork of state obligations in a second. But, um, but like I've said, there is no federal um, statute giving us guidance as to how we should treat our data, what contracts we have to have, what written policies, if any, we would have to have. Um, that's unfortunately kind of coming about piecemeal at a state by state level, making it really difficult for companies to comply. Uh, there have been attempts, um, many attempts, frankly, at federal legislation that would give a more global approach, uh, at least national approach. Uh, but so far, everything has um, died um, on, on its way um, or never even really made it to um, far out of committee. Uh, the biggest uh, blockage to uh, federal uh, legislation at this point uh, won't come as a surprise to anybody. It is based on um, uh, the difficulty at reaching a bipartisan agreement. Um, for the most part, uh, there's a general agreement on the need, and uh, it certainly is a highlighted focus of this administration. Uh, but the um, differences come down to whether preemption and a private right of action are going to be included. So preemption means whether one federal law will trump um, existing state laws like the California law that we're gonna talk about in a second. Which one will control if one is more uh, restrictive than the other? Republicans want there to be preemption at the federal level. So just one, the, the federal law is gonna um, be the guiding one and you can't have a state law that's more restrictive. Democrats don't want that. Um, the other area of difference is uh, whether the uh, statute uh, at a federal level would allow for a private right of action, meaning if a company uh, fails to have a vendor agreement or fails to have a written breach response plan, if that's in there, that a individual that is affected by that failure could sue themselves. The, um, the Republicans don't want a private right of action. They would prefer, which many state statutes have, that any enforcement of that statute be done by an attorney general's office. Um, the Democrats uh, do want the ability for a private right of action. And um, we'll see if compromise can be reached. Um, <laughs> you all will be as surprised as I will. Um, if compromise in any way can be reached, but um, but there's overwhelming need for some consistency, which you'll see in a moment as I go through some of the state statutes at issue. The big one you've probably heard of and, and what is currently providing the most um, contractual and uh, um, housekeeping compliance for entities is the California Consumer Privacy Act, CCPA. It became effective at the start of last year, um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, and in part because of the pandemic, but other reasons, the actual um, 
uh, aggressive enforcement uh, to the extent that that's even happened at all really didn't start until mid year last year. Uh, businesses are often coming to me asking if CCPA even applies to them because they're thinking they're not located in California. Um, it can apply to you outside of California, although there is case law right now on cases that are trying to challenge that um, the, whether or not California has the jurisdiction to do what they want to do. But the CCPA, as it's currently written, um, and as the law currently sees it, it applies to any business if it operates for profit, collects personal information of California residents, so that's already a lot if you um, have a website or engage in website sales. If you do business in California, um, that's there's no real guidance on that, but, um, but there are, are looking at tax laws and other things like that. Um, there are a lot of ways that uh, one can quote do business in a given state without being present there and then satisfies at least one of the following and the following are meant to try to exclude some small businesses from having to comply with ccpa's requirements on holding data of california residents um, and treating data of, of california residents in a certain way um, but there's been critique that these criteria don't in fact limit it to the um, smaller businesses that the legislature sought to. So there's, there is an amendment that I'll talk about um, in a moment that does change a little bit of this criteria. But for the moment, the law is that um, if, if an entity has a gross revenues in excess of 25 million, collects um, for commercial purpose, personal data on 50,000 or more California residents or households, that's important, devices, um, or if uh, a business derives half of or more of its annual revenues from selling California residents personal information, then it must comply with respect to the California resident information that it has. A lot of businesses end up getting roped in under that gross revenues in excess of 25 million. And, and therefore, this is a, a very expansive in its current state act. Um, CCPA has a lot of requirements, so I'm just going to focus on the contractually um, related ones. Uh, but certainly, um, in many contexts, due diligence contexts, um, I am seeing increased questions on how a business has assessed whether or not it's complying with CCPA. Uh, for entities um, that are um, under CCPA, if you have, if you share personal information with another entity like um, a human resource uh, con a contractor, a um, payroll, uh, in some instances, um, IT vendors, then unless you have a written agreement documenting that relationship and the controls with respect to data, the agreement um, would, uh, you would uh, let me back up. You would you would want that documentation to show that you're sharing with a service provider. If you didn't have that documentation, meaning you didn't have a contract, you would um, have to provide a lot more opt out options to those with whom you collect the information. So businesses save themselves from some of the opt out obligations that they may have when they are providing information to a documented service provider, and it's important to keep that documentation. If you have um, a service provider that you're providing personal information to, and that, um, at, at least with respect to that of California residents, you would want to make sure you have contracts showing that they will not um, retain the data for longer than they're supposed to or use it in any way that's um, outside of the business purpose for which you're giving it to them. If you give your IT vendor um, personal information, they shouldn't then be able to sell it for marketing purposes or something like that. Um, it, you would have to also make sure that your vendor, um, aside from just doing due diligence and um, on their capabilities and security, you would want to make sure that they're aware of their requirements under CCPA and that they affirm that um, in the contract that you have them sign. Um, if, if you're sharing with an entity that's um, not a service provider to you, like for marketing, you're selling the information in some way, then you need to provide on every page of your website and through other avenues, the ability for a customer to, with one click to say, do not sell my information. And you need to abide by that for that particular customer. 
Um, there's um, privacy policy. That's, this is not new to the CCPA. California has long had a requirement that any um, business that's touching the state has a privacy policy, which would mean if you have a website, um, you need to have a privacy policy, a privacy notice on that website. There are other states that have this requirement too. And we'll talk about what should be on there in a minute. But um, with CCPA gives increased guidance as to what kind of disclosures need to be on your privacy policy, including um, telling the um, California constituents that they have a right to request the deletion of their information, um, that they have a right to request a copy um, uh, and disclosure of who you've shared with um, and other in related information. And um, you cannot discriminate against any California resident that asks for those um, rights to be executed. The CCPA also requires that you update your privacy notice annually. Um, and so that essentially means that everybody has to update their notice annually. Um, there's, uh, like I said, plenty of other requirements under CCPA that could be a whole webinar in and of itself. But focusing on what you need to document your compliance with, which would be the service providers and your privacy policy. And these are some of the hot topics that insurance companies will ask for. Um, the, the, there's some guidance here. So I mentioned an update, um, which did happen at the end of the year of last year, um, the California Privacy Right Act. Uh, some changes. Uh, it won't come into effect until 2023, so the CCPA guides until then. Um, it did, in an effort to focus on larger businesses, um, up that 50,000 uh, person uh, requirement to 100,000. It outlined more specifically and, and similar to Europe the um, that companies need to engage in efforts to um, limit um the data that they collect only collect what you what you actually need um and uh, expanded opt-out rights it created a new category of sensitive sensitive personal data that has heightened protections although um the definition of it would include um, things like driver's license and things like that that a lot of people wouldn't necessarily think is sensitive um but um but worth noting uh for your future as you try to comply with all of these ever-changing laws, um, that that will be a new category for 2023. It expanded some of the existing rights that were under CCPA um, and um, added rights like the right to, to correct misinformation or limit the use of sensitive personal information and um, and made gave more information on automatic, automated decision-making and opt-outs. Um, one also, I think helpful piece is that it added a um, California Privacy Protection Agency, so they will have rulemaking authority, we believe, and will um, hopefully be giving more guidance as to what um, businesses can do to comply with CCPA and CPRA in the future. They actually met for the first time this week to start, the board did at least, um, to start planning for the agency itself. and where it will be located and, and what it will focus on. So we are all watching that to get guidance there and see what um, entities uh, California Attorney General's office is gonna focus on. Virginia is the second state to kind of have a comprehensive um, policy, not exactly like CCPA, and, and this kind of underscores the complication of having each state sort of do their own similar but different thing in that it makes it really difficult for companies to comply when it's not limited to just companies that exist within the geographic area of that state um, but is expanded like CCPA and, and the Virginia Act um, to those that are doing business in some way with that state. Um, so there are it's actually a little bit more limited as far as who it would apply to um, based on the um, need to control or process personal data of 100,000 Virginia residents or derive 50% of revenue from the sale of at least 25,000 Virginia residents, but it is still sweeping. Um, the um, Virginia Act will um, require um, uh, exempt, there are some exemptions to applicability, like um, those that are covered under HIPAA and some nonprofit and higher education institutions. 
but it has a really expansive uh, view of personal data, just like the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, and, and kind of circling back to what we talked about before, this is an example of where there's no private right of action for consumers, but at least in the insurance space, you're still going to have to show your compliance if it applies to you and that you've considered whether it applies to you. Um, just an example of a kind of state that has a data type specific statute um, that people don't always think about. Illinois' BIPA statute has a focus on biometric uses. It's actually been around for quite some time, since 2008, but didn't really get traction until 2015. Um, focusing on the documentation um, that you would need to have if this applies to you, again, it's going to apply outside of the state. So if a company collects biometric data on um, an Illinois resident, like a fingerprint or something like that, um, which will increasingly be the norm through for time management or um, security access or other things like that, um, facial scans, retina scans. Uh, you need informed, written informed consent from the individual to collect, and um, you will need to show that um, documentation that you maintain it. Um, there's been some litigation on this already. Facebook got hit with a really big lawsuit um, with respect to failure to comply to BIPA. Um, so um, the, it's actually been used um, more on non-Illinois and businesses than it has Illinois. Um, and then finally, just this one's in the news, Colorado Privacy Act, it passed this uh, last, it passed out of the legislature, at least this last week. Um, it's waiting on the governor's signature. He has 10 days in which to veto it, but everybody thinks it's gonna go through. So this is the third. Again, underscoring the patchwork, how difficult this could be um, to comply with for companies. Um, like other states, it's going to require written contracts, but these contracts need to have different language in it um, than CCPA. It's that the the um, Colorado Privacy Act um, will want your, the contract to describe the type of personal data, the nature and purpose, um, the duration of the processing. Uh, the subcontractor uh, may be used only after a period of objection and um, that the compliance obligations are clearly passed on through the contract itself. So keep it on your radar. Make sure that you're complying. It, it won't come into play until 2023 um, as well. It'll be a big year for our data privacy compliance. Um, there are plenty of other state restrictions, um, some of which I mentioned before. Um, some states have a written a requirement that you have a written breach response plan, like Massachusetts. It often only comes up for my clients once they've had a data breach and they have to notify just a single Massachusetts resident. They also have to notify the AG's office in Massachusetts. And every time I get a letter back asking for proof of the company having a written data um, incident response plan and um, information security program. So um, best to have that even before um, and hopefully never happens um, a security incident. And I'll talk about some of the, the best practices to have in those plans. Um, briefly, you could spend days on GDPR, but if you are um, uh, touching information of the EU resident that could be considered personal data, you will likewise want to have data processing agreement. I list here some of the things that need to be included, um, some of which will overlap with CCPA or Virginia statute, some of which um, are unique to Europe. Um, there's also a requirement if you are getting information of individuals outside of Europe that you have a, um, a, a legal ability to transfer data outside of Europe. So if you are a, a multinational organization or you work with organizations in Europe, it's something you should think about um, whether it applies. But you will want to, um, there used to be a mechanism in the United States called the Privacy Shield that would allow companies that have essentially shown that they have data security measures that would be acceptable under European standards to transfer data with ease, that has been negated by the European courts. Um, so we're sort of left in limbo other than um, there are standard contractual clauses that can allow 
an individual transfer that companies are availing themselves of. Um, but that can be um, time consuming and difficult. And there's a lot of skepticism about whether in Europe, at least, whether those are even appropriate, but those contra standard contractual clauses are meant to outline and document the security measures that a company put into place to make sure that the transfer um, isn't going to, um, the transfer itself isn't gonna expose data. And once it reaches the United States, that the US organization is gonna um, keep the data safe. Um, in Europe, um, GDPR likewise has a robust privacy uh, notice and policy requirement. So again, touching Europe, you sh um, your insurance company is likely going to ask you whether you've considered GDPR and how you comply. So um, whether or not you have a statutory requirement, which after I just went through all that, I think most companies would, um, to, to document your um, agreements when you share data, um, it is still a best practice that you would want to show and then insurance may seek that you have agreements once um, data leaves your company for how the uh, receiving company is going to treat that data if it contains personal information. So I, I have here um, important clauses that all of these agreements should have, whether required by statute or not. I'll talk about a few with ask the asterisks next to them in detail. But uh, the general principles that your agreements should have with your vendors is that um, you're going to outline the use of the information, why you gave it to them, and where it's allowed to be disclosed. The categories of information, um, even if you're not sharing personal information, it's still important to protect your confidential information, business trade secrets, et cetera, that you might be sharing with the vendor or a vendor might have access to. The, um, the security and confidentiality protections that you will require the vendor to employ, uh, that can include the employees that they, a vetting process, what subcontractors they're allowed to use, um, what kind of um, other storage, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, um, security measures, things like that. How the data can be collected, stored, destroyed, what audit rights you might want to have on the security measures that are in place and what's going to happen at the end of a contract. If there's a breach, um, you would want to outline who has responsibilities and what they're going to do and um, what your remedies are and whether um, if you're the sharer, especially you're going to be entitled to any kind of indemnification. If you're the vendor, um, in, in contrast, you will want liability caps. Um, importantly, um, while we're talking about the insurance coverage you, you as an entity might be seeking, you also want your vendors to be carrying insurance um, that may cover uh, a breach or an issue under the contract. And it's important for your agreements to um, specify what, bear, what minimums you would expect them to have, um, as well as the, the law that you would want applied. So just focusing on a few of these, um, your security and breach contract terms. Um, I outlined some of the uh, subtopics that you would want, um, language that you would want in there. Certainly compliance with the law, um, but um, not only is there a question of whether or not um, entities are going to do that, but the, the contract itself um, is going to provide yet another avenue aside from uh, compliance with the statute for you to pursue a claim um, if something does happen to the data. Because like I, I've said before, not all of these statutes have private rights of action, which are going to allow a civil lawsuit for recovery. Um, you, some standards exist out there for you to cite to the um, International Organization for Standardization. Um, if you are dealing with credit cards, the payment card industry data security standard, um, but also NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, all of which can provide some guidance as to the level of security you may want your vendor to employ. Um, you'll want to outline data breach notification, the notice time frame, and, um, and what remediation you would expect, like cooperation, um, what expenses you would expect to be compensated, um, your notice, uh, maybe attorney's fees, maybe the staff time, um, fines that you, you may incur if a vendor causes a data breach, lost profit or income. Um, but I've even seen, uh, although I'm on the other side of this now, um, angst and um, distress. <laughs> but uh, 
I would be surprised if you could get that through on the contract, but um, I have seen pe people try to claim it. Uh, one other contractual principle, um, I use some language here from um, uh, that's pro customer, so kind of depends on which side you're on, but practical law standard on indemnification with respect to a security incident, um, you're going to want to detail who's going to control the defense of any incident um, and um, your ability to dictate, um, you know, uh, the legal approach, um, depending on which side you're on, if you're the uh, entity that, that's providing the information, the controller, or if you're the service provider, um, you'll have different interests. And um, what kind of um, settling um, of claims input each side may have. Um, but it's important to look at the indemnity clause um, that's being used time and time again with respect to um, security incidents. And um, it's one um, area that I am constantly dealing with insurance companies on as to whether um, indemnification is covered under a given agreement, um, but also just the language that an insurer would like to see. Um, flip side would be if you're a service provider, especially the cap, um, if you're trying to limit your liability, that can be based on money, it can be based on the type of damages, um, it can be based on if it's um, a confidential uh, uh, information breach, which your um, damage might be pretty different than a data breach where personal information is, is exposed. Um, another topic I wanted to cover um, that I get asked out about a lot is, okay, so we put this contract in place with a vendor, but um, those are just words, and how do we vet whether this is truly um, an appropriate entity to contract with and they're going to protect our data? So um, I have some common questions that I think should be asked in the due diligence process when picking a vendor. Increasingly, the law is going to require um, these that appropriate due diligence be done. Some of the state statutes already do that, and it's important to document that you did it. It's it's one thing to ask these questions and nobody keeps a record of it, and then that employee you know leaves the company that that conducted the due diligence. You don't have evidence of what you did, so I encourage you again to you know implement a robust document management and tracking process so that you, if ever are called upon, can demonstrate to a regulator or to an insurance company that this you know, IT company that you're using was vetted and vetted well. Um, things you'll wanna ask about include the breaches that have occurred in the past, the way data is stored, the technology that's used um, both for collection, but also for the storage and destruction and um, a general vetting of their privacy policies and other compliance measures, um, which will give a good indication of how important uh, they think that data security and privacy and management is in their space. Talking about privacy policies, um, I touched on this before when talking about the um, California's regulations, but um, I am asked for these often um, when conducting due diligence and helping in that process, both um, from an acquiring entity, but also from their insurance. And so um, what we're looking for, um, but again, conflicting or at least guidance that that maybe is has the same destination, but gets there different ways. Uh, but the general uh, best practices would um, include you want your um, your privacy policy to be really accessible um, and um, not full of legalese. Um, accessible has another meaning too, with uh, at least under California's law, which requires uh, options for those with disabilities to access and understand the uh, privacy policy and other um, other notices of a California resident's right with respect to their data. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, best practice is to have a layered policy where you can sort of click on different um, topics and get more detail as needed. But but it's all about making sure that um, a reader understands their rights. You want to talk about the type of information that's collected and the purpose, storage, use of cookies is important, um, not required yet in the United States, but um, a separate cookie policy can become more clear to a reader. 
um, as, they're, as they're trying to understand how their data is being collected and used. Um, disclose the use of third party service providers, at least in a general sense that you use IT companies, HR, um, whatever else it is uh, that you share personal information with. If you have affiliated sites, you'd want to disclose that. Um, if you are required to provide opt outs, um, which um, you may be under CCPA and, and increasingly other laws, um, the, the logistics of that should be disclosed clearly in the privacy policy so that a consumer can actually exercise that, um, as well as contact information. And um, if you have um, data subjects exercising their right to opt out or any other rights they may have um, under various statutes, you'll want to show compliance and documentation with that, um, uh, with that request in case you're ever asked. Uh, incident response plan, here are some general guidance um, that I have. Um, this is probably one of the most asked for documents um, from insurance. Um, you want, first of all, who are your team members? Um, be expansive, but, um, but they need to be those that um, are going to move the ball forward. It should always include leadership, legal, um, and consider uh, what, if any, information may need to be protected by attorney-client privilege um, if you're anticipating litigation. Human resources, obviously ITs, I'm going to have a big role um, in the event of a data breach. And then you'll have external team members too that you should vet ahead of time and in some instances have on retainer like a forensics company. I have had a number of instances late, lately with security incidents where there's only so many reputable vendors and I have had vendors just unable to come to major companies aid. I'm talking energy companies affecting the grid um, because of so many um, ransomware attacks or other security incidents. So you're, you've got a, a step ahead of the game if you've got one on retainer. Um, depending on your industry, you might need to consider a PR as well. You want to make sure that your um, employees in general understand the procedures and what to do if they suspect a security incident. Um, they need to understand what an incident or a breach is and what to do in the event of either one. Um, first steps under your response plan will clearly be to secure whatever vulnerability may exist um, and, and make that a first priority. While at the same time, you'll um, want to consider what evidence you need to preserve. It's not like you can just take the server offline and throw it away. I mean, you'll want to preserve what happened um, in the event regulators or, um, or third parties uh, end up you know, seeking that and through investigation or litigation. Uh, the response plan and how you're going to investigate what happened and how you're going to communicate that, uh, whether you have contractual obligations outside of statutes to communicate security incidents uh, to customers or, or others um, should be known ahead of a, a security incident just because it's a all hands on deck moment. So taking the time to research who you need to um, tell and when should be done before anything ever happens. How you will remediate the incident and when you will provide notification to third parties and how it will be done. Um, I recommend a central point of contact. Uh, developing frequently asked questions so that the same, you know, customers that are calling are getting the same answers. Um, and it's agreed upon language amongst your, your leadership and team members and what kind of communications will happen to the government, making sure that's all in line. Um, you can kind of show, uh, demonstrate the priority you place on information security uh, by your internal policies with um, your employees. So employment agreements, when you have them um, or in your handbook, um, you need to talk about confidentiality and how your employees should treat it. Um, talk about um, not bringing in unauthorized data from others. This really goes more to protecting trade secrets that you have and also not um, exposing yourself unnecessarily to competitive threat by a new hire bringing material to your systems that they shouldn't. Um, but you should provide um, written confirmation of that and training, and that will limit your kind of business litigation exposure, um, so to speak, to, um, to not um, have a anti-competitive kind of litigation uh, at your doorstep. 
have computer use policies and give guidance to your employees about what they should and should not access. Um, mobile device policies uh, likewise provide protection and also can give you tools to avoid uh, exposure to security incidents. How you store data um, and including um, external drive and cloud storage is increasingly important. What's appropriate to put on there, what's not. Um, whether you're going to allow um, some cloud providers that maybe have less security to even be accessed on your system. My firm's really limiting on, on a lot of third party sites where data could be shared because of security concerns. International travel policies, um, if you have employees that travel to certain countries, um, your data is really exposed in that instance. We, um, for, we have a list of countries that our employees tra um, may travel to where we essentially give them a burner phone and a burner computer so that it's not one that um, has sensitive client data on it or connects to our system through VPN if they're traveling to China per se, because um, just assume that um, it has been exposed once you connect to Wi-Fi. Um, document retention policies are likewise important, something that insurance companies love to see. It shows good data hygiene. Um, and of course, the breach, the disaster incident response plan we, we spoke on. Um, when we're talking about computer use, you want to make sure that Employees know what's appropriate use of a computer, what's not. Um, the, the security measures that are in place at your company, where things should be stored, if you have um, you know, trade secret or confidential documents, how they should be stored or labeled, when encryption is required. Increasingly, um, companies are, are um, having that even at the email level. And I, I should add that um, in, um, in many state statutes, though not all, um, there is a, sort of a safe harbor if encrypted data is exposed to a security incident against mm -hmm. having to do that mass notice um, to affected parties. So encryption um, is sort of um, one of those moments of um, and you never know what you saved um, in doing it, but if you did have a security incident and it was encrypted data that was affected, you may be saved from certain notice obligations that can get expensive. Um, and then we've talked about some of the uh, external sites. Also, increasingly, I see companies have, have policies against use of um, USBs and other things like that on their system. Um, I've even seen them fill in the USB port with um, super glue so <laughs> to stop USB usage, um, mainly out of concern of um, important uh, trade secret type data being taken from the, their systems, but um, USBs also can sometimes provide uh, an avenue for a bad actor to put something on your systems. Um, watch the use of software. Um, and your IT department should already be aware of sort of anti um, forensics or other harmful programs that I have seen employees put on devices so that their um, activity, if they are deciding to take trade secret information, for example, is um, not as easily detected. Um, and, um, and one final point is that your computer use policy, especially in light of um, more of a virtual environment that we're all in where people are working in lots of different places, but you should really control the forced patching of your network to ensure its security. Again, these are measures that, um, that are a little bit more technical, um, but documenting that policy, I think will be um, comforting for an insurance company to see. Um, but also something that everybody should be thinking about regardless. And then um, finally, um, just thinking about the data security in uh, an M&A context, um, I kind of outline here sort of due diligence topics that I like to see um, asked when um, considering a merger or an acquisition of another company. Um, realize that you are you are acquiring their um, their risk in in some instances, and that risk could be data related. Um, I'm dealing with one right now where um, we have discovered a um, security incident that occurred about um, three weeks before the transaction um, closed, but has now been discovered, and so we are figuring out lots of different things, including 
what um, the due diligence process can and should um, have revealed and um, what um, other contractual avenues may exist. But, but here um, is a lot of the topics that I think should be covered through the due diligence process so you know what you're getting and certainly that insurance um, would like to see. Um, and so with that, um, my contact information again, if there's any follow-up questions I'm not able to address, but um, I'll turn it back to you, Alyssa. Great, Sarah, thank you so much. Um, that was uh, it was really um, a ton of information and, and quite candidly, um, some of the questions that I thought we'd get, some of the questions I thought I'd have you answered even in much more comprehensively than, than I would have, even, have ever even thought to ask. Um, you know, everything that you covered um, are questions that I get almost every day from our clients in terms of values of um, insurance, the insurance limits and around contractual requirements. And, you know, one of the, the most common questions I get that specifically I saw you reference on slide 20 was what can you expect of vendors that you're sharing personally identifiable information or any type of confidential information with? And you've really given us quite a laundry list of um, really great best practices, even getting all the way towards the end to the M&A due diligence questions. So um, really just wanna thank you so much um, for the presentation today. Um, you know, as everybody knows, Parker Poe is a trusted partner for NFP. Um, if anybody has any questions specifically, needs help on the front end with any of the resources that Sarah mentioned, um, privacy help, help and or editing with their privacy policy and or business continuity or incident response planning, certainly please reach out to me. We can work with Sarah. Uh, we can get favorable rates. And certainly, if unfortunately, you find yourself in the midst of an incident and you do or you don't have insurance, Parker Poe is a great resource to help you respond and figure out what your obligations are. So again, just want to thank everyone for joining us. Sarah, thank you so much for that really informative presentation. And for anyone that was on the presentation, know that a recording will be available this coming Monday. So thank you again. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.